So a few days ago on my one of my social media pages, I shared a meme making fun of Richard Dawkins with, his, uh, I don't know if it's new, but he has a children's book for atheism out. I haven't looked much into it. Most Christians who are in apologetics and honestly, many atheists as well, do not consider Richard Dawkins to be sort of an intellectual voice in the debate on whether or not God exists. That is not to say he's unintelligent or anything like that. Uh, he's considered, you know, excellent in his field, I suppose. I haven't studied his field of biology or whatever anyway, though, so I, I couldn't speak on that. However, when it comes to philosophy, which is where we would look at, you know, concerning questions on the existence of God, uh, as well as theology, when it comes to those two subjects, he is woefully inadequate in his <laughs> in his arguments. So all that to say, I shared a meme making fun of sort of like the types of questions he asks about God's existence. Given all that, an atheist friend of mine was upset that I was treating those questions in a sort of, you know, hand-waving sort of way, and they were written in sort of a, a childish way. So he asked if I would be willing to answer them in a more mature sort of form for the questions, and he provided six, well, more than six, but it's categorized into six sort of different topics. And uh, so I decided that I'd do a video on it, and so here I am. So like I said, it's six questions, well, six categories, and like with each question there will be like sort of sub-questions for some of them. I will do them one by one, and here we go. If the universe is fine-tuned for life, why does most of the observable universe, as well as places on Earth and throughout Earth's history, not support life? So this is a question that ha I've heard it multiple times from atheists. I I've heard all of these from atheists before. And I find this one really odd because y you're presupposing a particular plan that God has in mind, that God namely wants at this exact moment, I guess every single planet, moon, even stars and space itself to have to support life. I, it, it just seems sort of an odd thing. Um, I would say, I would venture to say God is quite the artist. He loves, he, he, he loves beauty and you just see that all throughout creation. And if you look into a starry night, you see that, uh, you know, just like one of the things I, I'm kind of slightly upset that I, I was born, you know, quote, so early, I, I would have loved, I would love to be part of like space exploration and things like that, because I would love to explore space. So the idea that the universe is only created specifically for supporting life and every single square inch of space has to do that is just an odd position. Uh, it, it, it's an argument I've never really, like, it, it feels contrived, I should say. So that's enough for that first one. Uh, second question, if God is good... Oh wait, no, I want to do that one last actually. So I'll do... Because that one is actually, that one actually, I would say, is a, the most serious out of these six categories. So we'll skip that one for now, and I'll do that at the end. Three, uh, if humans are so superior to animals, why are we pretty much just like other animals, except just a little smarter? In parentheses, very similar biology and psychology. So we are creatures like animals in the sense that we we all have dna and uh you know physical bodies and all that sort of stuff so um even there though there's a, a bit of a divide between us and, and and animals uh however on the psychology part and the intelligence part i i find it odd to claim that we're just a little bit smarter i have not seen a raccoon make a youtube video unless you're talking about um Oh shoot, what's that raccoon in, in the Marvel movies? That one. Yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> that's the only time, I guess you could say. Um, we are 
far more intelligent than raccoons and dolphins and whales and deer and lions and tigers and bears. So we are, I mean, just look at what we have made. What animal has made anything, you know, what animal species has made anything even close to the amount that we have made? What animals and species are having philosophical dialogues, are, you know, creating, you know, this sort of art that we create, uh, are, are like going out into space and exploring space, you know, like those things are not being done by animals. Uh, very minimally, like some monkeys are making tools-ish, kind of, barely, <laughs> you know. So um, that, that it's just not true. We, when it comes to intelligence, we are far more intelligent than animals. And also, this one, if we're going on a pure theistic question, not talking about Christianity, where Christianity understands humanity as a special... Uh, sort of the ambassadors of God for creation. You know, we, we so we are the image bearers of God. So if we ignore that, and if you look at just like a God created the universe kind of thing, not talking about a particular religion, there's no reason to believe, if that is the case, that God would demand humans to be far superior to other species. Um, so even if this was a good objection, which it's not, but even if it was, it would only be a good objection for Christianity, not a good objection against belief that God exists. So that, I, just on multiple levels, that fails, I, I would say. All right, the next question. If the fact that the universe exists... He, he worded this weird, so I'm trying to... I just copy-pasted it, sorry. Uh, Okay, the fact that God that the universe exists because of its uh, complexity is evidence that it was created. Then shouldn't the fact that God exists and is complex mean He was created? Uh, by that logic, why does the universe have to have had come from someone? Why not just somewhere? Why couldn't a natural universe have had a natural cause? All right. So the problem with this one is that. The idea of God is not that he is complex. God is not a complex being. There's a there's an understanding called uh, divine simplicity. God is not made up of parts and pieces. He is a, a a he is the metaphysical mind, and from him comes the rest of you know from him is created uh, all of existence. So we wouldn't say that God is more complex than the universe. We would say he's actually divinely simple. And that has been for a long time. Now, it, it, the details of a lot of that is contested within Christianity, and there's a debate within it, but most Christians I know would hold to some form of divine simplicity. Um, although they wouldn't call it quite that. But so we're... Regardless of that, he, he's, he, he's not made up of parts and pieces. So th there's a problem right there. Now, suppose we want to say, well, actually, no, God is more complex. The problem with claiming that he's more complex, so therefore he has to have been created, uh, while I would hold to that as a good critique, I don't think it necessarily flows. Now, his point being that, well, then why do we say the universe has to come from a mind if, you know, if the mind is more complex and all that sort of stuff? So the problem with this, though, is that you don't need an explanation for the explanation. Um, actually, William Lane Craig sort of, uh, I think it's Craig, he talks about this. He, he gives an example that suppose we went to a distant planet and we found what were the equivalent of something like arrowheads or, or some, you know, some form of uh, what, what seems to be clearly manufactured by intelligence. The, you know, so one of the astronauts says, oh, look, there has to have had been life here at some point. And then the other one says, oh, no, no, you see, this isn't really complex. And whatever made it, if it did make it, it's even more complex. And you can't explain how they came about. So therefore... Your, your entire hypothesis is, is bunk. 
No, that, that's not how it works. You don't need an explanation of the explanation in order to give an explanation. Now, again, it goes back to that, the, that problem, though, I would say, where we are not talking about a complex being. We're talking about God who is divinely simple. There are other parts that we see. So why does the universe have to have had come from someone? Um, so the universe has a beginning. All of the current cosmological data indicates that. Uh, the Big Bang and all that sort of thing uh, demands that this universe started at some point in history, you know, in our past. So the problem is, though, because of that, that's all of space, all of time, all of matter, all of energy, in you know, all of the natural world. So if there's something that starts the natural universe, it itself cannot be natural. It has to be something beyond nature, therefore supernatural. So you can't, so for instance, you know, you can't be, I, I, let me think, you can't be, you know, your own mother. Well, that, that kind of word. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. The idea being that if, it, if all of nature began at the, at the Big Bang, which is what they would call it, then it can't be something that's nature that started that. It has to, it, by definition, it has to be beyond nature, metaphysical, supernatural, whatever you want to call it. If you don't like the term supernatural, we could use something else. So now with that, he goes, why not just somewhere? Why, why couldn't it be a natural universe that had a natural cause? You could do that. You could go to turtles all the way back, though. But one of the arguments I like, and it, it's sort of connected with like the Kalam cosmological argument as well, but... Let, let's say we we have to talk about a beginning that happened, all right? So think of whatever actions, let, let's say you're supposing as an atheist a sort of completely mechanistic structure. For each action that happens, think of it as one domino in a list, in a you know line of dominoes going back all the way to the beginning. Now, let's say you want to posit something even before the Big Bang. So there's a domino here, that's the Big Bang, and then there's something, some domino that caused that Big Bang to happen, and then you go back. Eventually, you have to go to the beginning of that domino line, all right? So the question is, what caused that first domino to fall down? Now, you can. there are three answers that you can give. Well, I don't know is another answer, but I'm not really impressed with I don't know. I mean... I'm I'm glad for the I'm glad for the uh, humility I guess if it's being done humi uh, in a humble way but it, it, otherwise yeah anyway so you can either say that it uh, there is no beginning of dominoes which I would say that's just a sort of infinite thing that's not possible you can't have an infinite number of dominoes at all uh, the second one would be that it just it it just fell, but then you have to whatever caused it to fall like that would have to be the domino before it then, um, if, if it didn't have a will and and didn't you know cause itself to fall, then that I don't see how that can work. Then the third one, which I think is the only one that actually does work, is that the quote domino uh, decided to fall, not that God is a domino. Um, uh, this is just an analogy just to get the idea of actions being done. But the idea is that God is the only explanation that starts that domino line of movements going because the first action that happens has to be an action that happens willfully. Because if it's not done willfully, it's done because of a prior action done to it. Things don't purely of their own will happen if they don't have a will, <laughs> you know? So it, hopefully that makes sense. So I, I, I see a lot of problems with that sort of mentality. And again, God is not more complex than the universe. He's, he's as a divine mind, he is simple. All right, the next question, 
why does it seem like the Abrahamic religions, which would be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, why do they demand restrictions and sometimes outright forbid natural desires and needs? And shame, and why do they shame their believers and practitioners for even the thought? So this one's really vague, and uh, I mean, the big one usually for a lot of people is sex. <laughs> um, and sex is a powerful thing, and it should be treated seriously. And I don't understand, I've never understood why people get so bent out of shape that we are going to have a lot of rules concerning sex. One of the most, uh, one of the most horrifying acts is rape, and even talking about it is kind of controversial. To even talk about it <laughs> is, is, thought, is thought of as like, oh wow, taboo kind of, uh, definitely in a casual manner. But why, if it's if sex is not a sacred act, why is that so, you know, I mean, no one freaks out about the idea of someone poking someone, because poking is not a sacred act. Sex is the most intimate way that humans can interact with each other. The most, um, except maybe the Eucharist, I would say, you know, or the sacraments. Um, and, and the Eucharist is specifically because we're, we're, we're communing with God, you know. Um, or Jesus, I should say, as fully God and fully man, which would be the human interaction because he is fully man as well. But regardless, it is at least one of the most intimate acts that we can have. So why would we say, ah, no rules, who cares? You know, just as long as you consent, I guess. And why is, why is consent even important if it's not a big deal, you know? But it is a big deal. Part of it is the impact that that interhuman exchange, uh, you know, brings forth. It is a very, obviously, a very intimate uh, relationship that happens, or intimate action. But the other part is that it creates human life. So yes, you need to, <laughs> you need to be careful with this. If we care about human life, and if we care about our human interactions in the most intimate way, we are going to have rules about this. So it, it just, it, it, it boggles the mind, honestly, this this one. It, it's just sort of, you want rules on sex. Now, maybe he's thinking about something other than sex. Um, see, there's not really, <laughs> like, I guess drinking or or or, so, or or something like that. But, like, Judaism's fine with drinking. Christianity is fine with drinking, like, unless you're a fundamentalist. And then Islam is not. Um, maybe the bacon thing, but that's, again, Judaism and Islam. And... There are reasons why Judaism had rejections, like, uh, so pork uh, is not a, was not back then especially a healthy thing to eat. Um, <laughs> you know, th they were unclean for a reason, you know, these animals and stuff. Now, we've obviously been able to, you know, because of technology and all that sort of stuff, uh, been able to do things, excuse me, better. Um... But yeah, so I, that one just seems like an odd one to me. Uh, so let's see, the second to last one. Why is what is clearly natural so evil? Did God not create nature? Then why condemn it for being what he created it to be? So this one is kind of connected to the last one and to the, the last one I just did and to the one I will be doing next. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of be a little bit short with this one, I think. So why is it clearly, okay, why is what is clearly natural so evil? So when we say clearly natural and we say evil, I'm sort of confused by what he says there because he he's a former Christian and a lot of atheists are, so they should know about the, the concept of the fall and the fall has, has corrupted a lot of nature. Uh, in fact, all of creation has been corrupted through the fall. So that would explain that. Um, and what, but when he says clearly natural, um, so evil, I like, and, and what are we condemning also too? Then why condemn it for being what he created it to be? Maybe he's thinking about homosexuality, maybe, but 
I really find it hard to argue that homosexuality is natural. Now, if by natural you mean people do it, well, people do a lot of things. That doesn't mean it's natural. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I'm not going to spend much time on it because it, it's just such an odd thing. <laughs> like, there there are things that we reject, and, and like, for, you know, homosexuality is one, and it's because it is unnatural. It, literally, it is a misuse of the sexual organs. The sexual organs are for, part of it is for, procreation and it is explicitly not being used for procreation um, it, it inherently not being used for procreation uh, not possible to be used for procreation in those examples in in, in sodomy and, and all that so yeah um, then the final one if god is good and loves us why doesn't he stop child molesters what's up with cancer in kids would you stop these things if you had the power to? All right, so this one is the only one that actually is a good question, I would say, or set of questions. The problem of evil is something that is through, like, okay, so the first book in the Bible is, that was ever written, the earliest one, is not Genesis. It's actually the book of Job. Job is considered the earliest by most scholars to be the earliest book written in the Bible. And the book of Job is about this exact question. Why does evil stuff happen, especially to good people? So Job finally asks God after all this bad stuff has happened to him, and God comes down in a whirlwind, or in a, I think whirlwind, or something like that, and he's like, okay, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? And he just He's like, dude, you are a little man, and I am God. I know what I'm doing. I know why I do what I do. And he and God gives Job no answer. I find that to be really interesting, that no answer is given. And I think part of the reason is that there's not a single answer. Now, there is a single logical answer that we can give. The logical answer is you have to show that it is logically contradictory for God, as classically understood, to be inconsistent with the concept of evil existing. You have to show that, that, that it's logically impossible for God and evil to exist, all right? And it's not been shown. There is no logical inconsistency. And the only thing I have to do is say, well, God allowed for that evil action to happen because there would be a greater good that would come from it. All right? So think of it like this. In the midst of working out, you, especially if you are overweight or something like that, you are going to have immense pain. You might even throw up. And in the midst of those things, that pain, that, that throwing up and all that sort of stuff, is bad. But it is working towards a good thing. It is the outshowing of good things happening. It does not mean that that itself is good, but what is coming from that becomes good. So all I have to do is say, well, God has a morally justifiable reason to allow for evil to happen, okay? But most people, when they're asking this, they, they might say they want the logical answer, but they're really looking for the emotional answer. And there's no shame in that. Because at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Tell a little girl with cancer that? So, the, I think the best answer for that uh, question of why does evil happen in the world. First, we have obviously the fall that we talked about earlier. Second of all, though, Christianity is the only religion that I am aware of where the creator of the entire universe, who is not part of the universe, ends up coming down incarnate as fully as a human, and experiences a full adult life from childhood to adulthood, dies and suffers immense pain on our on our behalf. No other, you know, Judaism, obviously we we come from Judaism, so we we you know sort of see that connection there. Islam does not have that. Allah does not come down and suffer pain and death for our sake. And the reason that is so important is that 
what happens is what, what we're saying is that God himself is not telling us experience this sin, experience this pain, experience this evil while I sit on my throne. No, God himself comes down in the second person of the Trinity and takes on human flesh and he experiences that pain with us. And that empathy, that uh, as, as scripture says, you know, we do not, uh, we do not, uh, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember the passage right now, but we do not, uh, <laughs> it's in Hebrews, uh, we do not have a high priest who is, um, you know, who, who doesn't have our sufferings, but has been uh, afflicted in all ways uh, as we have, uh, something of that gist. So God actually experiences the sin and the pain and the death with us. And I think that's really powerful. What that tells me is that God actually cares and he is working through creation and through us, through human flesh, to bring about the restoration of creation. Because we are the ones, through Adam, through Adam's sin, who caused the fall. Now through Adam's flesh, God restores creation. So anyway, those are the six sets of questions. And like I said, most of them I, I think are really just not challenging. The only one I would say is challenging is the one about the question of evil. But I think that we've provided a pretty good answer here. So thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoy your day or night or whatever.